Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to go through a neat little measurement device from the 30s, and we're going to bring it back to life. So let's get started. This tool was used in the late 30s to mid 40s by radio operators to monitor the audio in their transmitted signal. So yeah, it was a pretty technical device way back when. Really what this thing is, is it's a small oscilloscope from the 30s. So you thought oscilloscopes were small now? Well, they had them back then as well. And to give you a size comparison, I'll grab my industrial sized coffee cup and place it right beside it. That's a pretty small oscilloscope for the 30s. This is a little one inch CRT, and we'll take a look at that here quite shortly. So, let's get the coffee cup out of the way there. So this thing has inputs on each side, inputs here and inputs here on this side. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this thing work and discover what all the knobs do on the face because they didn't actually put labels on this early electronic gear. In fact, a lot of the early radios and early electronic gear didn't have any labeling above the knobs because they just expected you to know what the stuff does. So basically work this stuff until you get comfortable with it and you'll know where the focus is and the brightness and whatever they've got on the face here. We'll discover this as we go along. Now, I can't really power this thing up because as you can see, that line cord is looking mighty scary. I don't want to plug that in. As you can see, it's just the plug is completely broken off. So usually back in the day, they had Bakelite plugs and they were very brittle and somebody's probably stepped on this thing at some time and then just completely broke it right off. So that's kind of scary. Got to get rid of this line cord, replace the line cord, and there's going to probably be some components inside here that are going to need replacing too before we put any power to it because we really don't want to damage it. It's never a good idea to take an old piece of gear like this, even if the line cord is good, you know, it's never a good idea to plug something like this in without doing a thorough inspection first and usually recapping the thing as well because you can cause a lot more damage if you, you know, just plug something like this in. A lot of the times the capacitors inside these things go bad and you know, if they do go bad and you plug the thing in, it's, you know, you're just going to make things worse. These nice little vents are great for letting the smoke out, so you definitely don't want to do that if you're going to try and restore something like this. I'm really hoping that the CRT in this thing is good. I do have a spare CRT in a box somewhere and you know I, as you can see in my you know new old time lab video I do have a lot of vacuum tubes and I'd have to you know narrow that down and find where I've actually put that CRT it's a really bizarre looking little CRT so what I'm going to do is reposition the camera here and I'll open the top up and you see here on the top it has one screw right there to get inside this thing and we'll take a look inside it is there's something rattling inside here, so I don't know if you can hear that. There it is. That doesn't sound good. So we'll see what the uh, what the damage is inside this thing. Hopefully the rattling piece isn't a piece of this CRT or anything like that. And we'll bring this thing back to life. We're gonna make this thing work. It really doesn't have a choice. When it's on this bench, it's going to work again. All right, let's open this thing up and see what's inside. One screw on the top here. Just remove this. And the top is spring-loaded. There's only one screw that holds this down, so there's gonna be something in the front here that's gonna hold that tight. It just turns out to be two little clips. So basically that's just making spring tension under the front side here to hold the front tight so it doesn't vibrate. And then this is just tightened down on the back. Kind of neat, minimalist design. So we'll just get the lid out of the way. Kind of messy and dirty. And we can immediately see the CRT, which looks a lot like a metal 6L6 with a little glass face on it. Just unplug the CRT very carefully here. There it is. Yeah, very much like a, a metal 6L6 with a glass top on it. 913 just put that down over here like that another vacuum tube down here let's remove this and see what this is very loose 6x5 6x5s are known rectifier tubes and there's a filter capacitor here 
which says two microfarad, lots of filtering there, two microfarad at 600 volts DC. So this would probably be a problem child nowadays. Powering this thing up with something like this is, you know, taking chances. If this thing was to short out, it would probably ruin that rectifier tube and possibly cause damage to the main power transformer here. Wouldn't want to do that. On the face of the unit is just a bunch of switches here. You can see a bunch of VRs, variable resistors here. Very basic oscilloscope. So what I'm going to do is try and get in through the bottom side. It looks like... I don't know what that rattling is. Let's see if I can get that to fall out of there. Oh, something fell out. Oh, it looks like the rubber grommet from the, uh, probably the line cord here broke off and fell inside. That's what that rattling is. Well, that's kind of nice. It's nothing major that's completely broken off. Looks to be a resistor down in there as well. So anyways, I'm going to try and get the bottom portion out. You can see that there's more screws here, and it looks like the bottom actually fits into the case. So I haven't had this thing apart at all at this point so you know as much as I do so what I'm going to do is remove these screws and see if this bottom portion comes out of here and makes it a little bit easier to get at obviously if this thing was a kit or was assembled at the factory they had to put all this stuff in there so I imagine that they just slid everything on top that might require the removal of the the VRs on the face here as well so I'll tackle that and I'll be right back I managed to get the case off the bottom so I had to remove all four screws. There's two here, two on the other side, and I removed the screws up here. And I also had to clip one wire here from the capacitor to the side that was also holding this together, basically holding this thing from, you know, coming off the bottom here. The reason that this 6X5 tube was so loose is you can see that there's a crack in the ceramic tube socket down there. So that'd be that reason there. And I'd also notice that right here, this is also cracked as well. So a little bit of super glue will fix that there. The ceramic tube socket, super glue fixes ceramic, well, you know, very well a lot of the time, but I don't know about this tube socket here. It's probably going to break again. So I'll most likely have to replace that socket. So hopefully I have something like that kicking about here. I can replace that. Now I can only get this just to pop up so far because there's wires holding this everywhere. But we can see inside here, the capacitor, you know, there's some waxy goo on the bottom side of the cap, which isn't a good thing. Somewhat of a, a cardboard on the front here. You can see the cardboard on the front side of that cap and it's been leaking. So get this down in here. You can see the waxy goop is scraping off the side of the cap. So it's obviously been warm. So hopefully the power transformer isn't damaged. Doesn't smell burnt or anything like that. So it's probably going to be okay. So in order for me to you know, get in here any further, I'm going to most likely have to get rid of the wiring on this side here, maybe on this side. And then this will probably just tip forward. It looks, looks to be, and I can get in here and, you know, fix what I need to fix before we apply power to this and see if we can get a trace on that CRT. So, so far, basically this cap's gonna have to go, that socket's gonna have to get replaced. And there's a little resistor down here. This may be okay still. And there's a resistor over here. I'll test that resistor as well. And looks like it might actually be working in short order. Well, let's hope at any rate. That was pretty straightforward to get this to tip up. Basically, you just unsolder three wires from that one connector on the side, and it just folds right up. So these wires here are what's holding it back. It looks like somebody else may have struggled with this in the past. That's maybe the reason that that connector is broken on the side. Good possibility there. So pretty easy to remember. The top wire here goes to the top lug, and the other two wires go to the bottom lug. Just that simple. That makes that nice and free so I can get in here and work. Now you can see this capacitor here has been riveted to the bottom here. There's a rivet down here. There's a couple more rivets on this side here. You can see those rivets right in here. Let's get that in the shot. Rivet there, rivet there. So 
Those will have to be drilled out so I can get this block out of here so I can replace this capacitor. So what I'll most likely do is put some form of a terminal tie point, terminal tie strip down here with a modern capacitor. You can also get rid of this line cord. You can see the line cords in here. May as well actually just get rid of that right now. Cut that off here. Get that out of there. So I'll replace the line cord. In order to get at the line cord, it goes directly under the transformer. The transformer itself is been stood off by these little standoffs here so removing these little nuts on the top here should allow me to get underneath the transformer so that I can replace this old line cord here with something quite a bit more safe and that'll allow me to get at the tube socket over here as well so without having to take all the controls off the face here so the next step would be to remove all the controls. Now, this crinkle coat stuff is very delicate. If I start removing the nuts that hold these variable resistors onto the face, it's probably going to take large chunks of this crinkle coat off. And at this point, I'm really not sure if I'm going to be able to salvage this. This side here looks pretty good. If not, I have plans for this thing down the road. I'm going to turn this thing into another little interesting dedicated piece of test gear, and I'll share that with all you guys when the time comes. So I might just strip this entire case, take everything out of it, strip the entire case, and then just repaint it with a, with a really nice paint so it looks really nice. So I'm undecided at that yet. You can see, I mean, it's looking a little bit rough. So we'll see how, see how I can clean this up. At that point, I'll determine whether I keep this or get rid of it at that point. So, so capacitor is going to get changed, terminal tie strip in, installed, new line cord, and I'll look at replacing this tube socket here. So, I'll lift the transformer up and we'll take a look at the underside of this thing first. Wow, look at this. They've ran the line cord directly into the transformer. And if that's not good enough, they've actually filled it with tar. So I've looked down that little hole there with a flashlight. You can see this little hole right here. And yes, it's completely filled with tar. Now, luckily, this is still flexible at this point. So what I'm going to do is cut the cord at this point here. And I'll separate the two wires from inside here. And I'll attach my new line cord at that point. Wow, directly right into the transformer. Wonderful stuff. Well, it was a nice surprise when I took the actual shield off of the wires here. The wires underneath the shield are in very good condition, nice and flexible. And, you know, they look pristine condition under here, so no problems with that. So what I'll end up doing is stripping these back and then putting a new reproduction cloth cord on here. I'm not going to do that right now though. I'll do that right in the very end. Reason being is because I'm going to be moving this thing around and you know tipping it back and forth and you know, I got to drill the rivets out on this capacitor and I really don't want to put any more strain on this than I really need to. So this will be the last thing that I do. I'll just I'll attach that line cord in the very end just before we test this thing. So what I'll do now is I'll put this back on the chassis just so this is held tight and we'll go after this capacitor here. I'll drill out the rivets on this capacitor and we'll test this thing out and see if it is still actually any good or not. The transformer is held back in place. I've just tightened the screws up here just, you know, just enough to hold it in place. So the next thing I'm going to do is drill out these rivets here. And as you can see, there's one down here. It's holding an actual terminal tie strip here. There's one here that's holding a, a ground lug here on this side as well. This resistor goes over there. This is just a ground, and this looks like a ground from the transformer. This goes to that lead on the opposite side there. And then this here is running off to the rectifier tube socket. So these need to be unsoldered, and I'll unsolder this here, move this out of the way. And at that point, I think I'll get this off the terminal here, and I can pretty much drill these out. You can see they've also put a little ground underneath there as well, right? See that right under here? So lots of little grounds kind of pop riveted in place here and held underneath this. So, you know, these connections aren't going to be very good. So what I'll probably do is when I 
fasten these down I'll clear off the chassis here and you know clean the connections and put some nice screws underneath these things so everything is making a good ground that'll really help things out here as well so that's the next thing I'm going to tackle and then I'll get this thing out of here and we can test this and see if the capacitor still works and that'll be a really good indication if anything has been you know done to the transformer because if this thing is a dead short or something like that we know that the transformer may have sustained some form of damage another good indication that you know, uh, this would have shorted and caused damage is a lot of the times what it does is it'll actually blow the, the bonding wire off the cathode inside the 6X5. So when you go to test the 6X5, they just test as dead. They don't even move the needle. The thing may be lighting up inside and the filament might still be connected in there, but the little bonding wire that bonds to the cathode shell that runs off to one of the leads here would just be blown open. That's very common with these things, especially when these capacitors here go bad or, you know, something in the high voltage power supply gets shorted, right? Let's test this capacitor for leakage using the new leakage tester. So I'll click this onto discharge here and I'll explain exactly how I'm going to test this. So I'll attach this here and here. It is in the discharge position, so it's not testing it right now. Now this is two microfarad and it's going to take a fair amount of time to charge this capacitor. So what I'm going to want to do is fast charge this in the electrolytic position. So right now, this is the paper poly and ceramic position. This is the mica and forecast position. And this is the electrolytic position and this will fast charge this capacitor. Now in the electrolytic position for a capacitor like this, it is not sensitive enough. So this needs to be tested in the paper, ceramic, and poly position here. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So I'll click this onto test and you'll see that this will go red and this will be right at the maximum leakage here, as you can see. So I'm gonna move this down to electrolytic and fast charge this. And you'll see this go right down to the green rather quickly. Now, when I return this switch back into the paper, ceramic, and poly position, this should stay green shouldn't move because it's already fast charged. If this turns red and this crawls back up, we know that we definitely have a leaky capacitor. So here we go. Fast charge it and instantly back into the other position. And as you can see, it's very leaky. So I'll fast charge this again. Let it sit for a moment. Really give it a lot of time to charge up. And we'll see if it drains its own charge off through its own internal leakage. And it definitely does. So what I'll do is I'll move this capacitor out of the way and I'll test a brand new one, the one that's going to replace this. So this is two microfarad at 630 volts, very suitable replacement. Put that right here. So I'll do the same test. So when I click this here, you'll see this go right up to the top. I'll fast charge it. And when I return this switch, this should stay green. If it stays green, the capacitor is good. Okay, so here we go. As you can see, no problems. Now these capacitors are so incredibly good that if I click this onto the forecast position, which is very, very sensitive to any type of internal resistance, if there is any internal resistance in this, this would immediately go right back up. So I'll click it onto forecast. And as you can see, this capacitor is very, very good. There's no problems with that at all. And that is what's going to replace this capacitor here. This capacitor is not an electrolytic capacitor. As you can tell by the size here, it's filled with wax. It's an old wax style capacitor in this case here. So this is definitely leaky. So I hope that that main power transformer has not been harmed. So I'll click this onto discharge here. Shut this off and remove this just to give you an idea of how incredibly sensitive this thing is on the forecast position. Just the resistance of me holding the boots of this capacitor tester will make this register. So I'll click this on to test here and this is in the forecast position. So I'll just grab the boots. And as you can see, look at that. So if I even grab insulated screwdrivers and just push the two boots close together, the resistance of the rubber itself on the boots will register. 
Look at that. Just the resistance of the actual rubber itself. So I explain this all in the video on Patreon. If you're interested in building one of these capacitor testers for yourself, incredibly useful tool to have at the bench. And this goes well beyond testing capacitors as well. So very, very sensitive device to any type of leakage, as you can see. Now that I've removed the rivets off the bottom pan here, I can see that there's no other wiring connections to this. So if I remove the nuts and the screws and the standoffs from underneath the transformer again and do the same for the tube socket here, I should be able to completely remove this bottom pan and clean it up nicely. As you can see here, look at this wax and goop all stuck onto the bottom here from that previous capacitor. So it'd be nice to really clean that up nice. So that's what I'm going to do now. And once I have everything off of here and cleaned up, I'll be back. I have the new capacitor mounted to the terminal tie strip. As you can see, I've cleaned the paint on the bottom of the chassis where this fastens. So there's a really good ground connection there. And I've also attached this terminal tie strip back in again. And I've reattached this resistor. Now, before you reattach any of the old resistors, it's always a really good idea to test them. The coding system for these resistors is BED, B-E-D. So body and dot. So the body's red, the end is green, and the dot is yellow. So two, five, four. So 250K ohms. And it tests right on, no problems. I also tested the resistor. That looks like a fuse. You can kind of see the resistor right there. That's a five meg ohm resistor, and it's also right on. So no problems at all with both of those resistors. You can see I've installed another tube socket here. This is a much more robust tube socket. It has a metal retainer ring. And when they build these tube sockets, this metal retainer ring is basically cast, or I guess you could say it's molded right into the base. So it's very, very strong tube socket. I really tighten this down. What cracks these ceramic tube sockets here, this is the one that I've removed. What ends up cracking these is when people tighten these down too tight, or if there's any chassis flex or anything, these things, they just bust. This is the same tube socket that they're using for the CRT up there. The CRT one is absolutely fine. So in order to use this tube socket, it has to be raised up quite a bit. And, you know, I had to do a little bit of measurement to make sure that the 6X5 is you know, not going to protrude through the top of the scope. And it's pretty, you know, there's a, a little bit of room left. And the nice thing about this is these 6X5s, the metal ones, are quite a bit taller than the glass ones. So if this was to get too close to the top, I could just put a glass one in there. The glass one is probably three quarters of the height of this 6X5. There'd be plenty of room. So I've stood this vacuum tube socket off with a standoff here, and I've also put some heat shrink tubing on that standoff because it is close to the pins. Now the pins don't touch the standoff, but that little extra bit of safety is you know, a good thing to have. So these standoffs are what hold the tube socket above the, the bottom portion of the chassis. And that worked out very well. Very, very sturdy install. So you can see that I've added some new piping to some of the wires here, just because some of them were cracked and they weren't looking all that great. So I added that in for some of those wires. And I've also installed a new line cord here. Now this is a reproduction cloth line cord. That's actually a plastic or a modern line cord with just a, a cloth looking covering on it. And that works really well. So you can see it's got a modern molded plug on it. It has this nice brown looking cord on it. So I figured I'd put that in there. Now here's the thing. I'm still undecided about this scope. You know, I'm, I might end up disassembling this whole thing again and just repainting the entire case. Cause again, I have an idea to repurpose the scope so that it can actually be used on the old time workbench. I'm not a fan of shelf queens. You know, I don't want to restore this thing and then have it sit on a shelf and then you know, basically look at it from then on. I'd like to actually put this thing into service and we can do some testing with this scope and I can show you how well this scope works for you know, even troubleshooting and things like that. So I'm kind of torn between you know the paint yet. So again, this whole thing may come apart. I'm really not sure at this point. So I'll clean up the case and make it look as good as possible. And after that, I'll, I'll get to the point to where I'm, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do here. 
So what else can I tell you about this? Oh, I fixed this on the side here. I put some glue on this and a very large washer. Now that large washer isn't making contact with anything, but it holds those terminals tight so that I can clip something on here. You know, I can actually push these spring-loaded clips without damaging anything. So that worked out very well. Yeah, let's see what else. This side here is looking pretty good. So at this point, really, what I have to do now is just solder up a few wires and put this back into the bottom here. I added this ground because this ground has to run up to this, this uh, little connection over here. So basically all I'll have to do now is put this thing all back together, tighten everything in, and we can see if the thing operates. See, I put a new grommet in the back here as well for the new line cord to slide through. A nice soft rubber grommet. Another thing that could be done before this goes back together is use your favorite contact cleaner in something like this and you know lubricate up the potentiometers in the switch here. That wouldn't hurt to be done right now. Now here's the thing, if you're going to want to paint something like this, you got to be very careful with contact cleaners and stuff. Unless you plan on sandblasting this or taking the, you know, the paint that's on it right down to the metal. If you get any of this contact cleaner stuff on the paint and you try and, you know, repaint this or something like that, you're going to have to really strip this down or there's going to be some problems, right? Because this, you know, the contact cleaner is, is a lubricant, right? So any kind of oil that you get on here is going to really affect things. So you're going to need to be very careful with that. If I was to strip this down, I would probably put this in my sandblaster and just clean this right down to bare metal and then put a brand new coat of, you know, fresh paint on it. Something like a black hammer tone or something like that would look, you know, A1 on this. I managed to find a schematic for this small oscilloscope. And there are a few discrepancies between the actual schematic and the parts list here. And I'll go over that as I'm explaining the schematic. So first of all, it is a very basic little oscilloscope and it really relies upon the amplitude of your signal in order to drive this up. You can see the vertical deflection goes directly into one of the vertical deflection plates. So there is no vertical amplifier here. So it would take a you know, pretty stout signal in order to make this thing you know, produce any sort of a sine wave or anything like that. Now making a small amplifier for this would be extremely simple. You use one vacuum tube and You'd have all the uh, vertical deflection that you need, something like a 6C4, maybe even one half of a 12AX7 or something like that. If you wanted to be fancy, you could use a transistor for that as well, whatever you're happy with. So over here, we have a negative rectifier. So this is actually hooked up in reverse to how you would normally see rectifier tubes in, say, audio amplifiers and things like that. And that's because the chassis itself is positive to this point right here. And you can see the capacitor is hooked with the positive portion going to the chassis. And there is a negative voltage at this point here running through all of these resistors acting as a divider. Now, whenever you're working on an oscilloscope, CRTs use negative voltages and you're gonna find a negative rectifier somewhere in the oscilloscope. Usually that rectifier has very high voltage on it. And you need to be very, very careful. So this here is going to be putting out between 5 and 600 volts. The capacitor itself was rated for 600, so it wouldn't obviously exceed that. Now, if you wanted to replace the 6X5 with, say, some 1N4007s or something like that, some, you know, some form of a diode, you'd have to be careful at that point because the B plus would probably go up. B plus, or I should say B minus in this case, the B minus would go up. So you got to be very careful. Now you'll see that it looks like this says C1 here. And if we look, it says C1.01 microfarad RF filter condensers. And then it looks like this is C2 in C2, but yet we have a C3 and there is no C3 on this. So one of these might be C2 and C3. So this is actually going to be C2. This is the two microfarad capacitor here on this side. This is not C1 like this looks like on the schematic. So this is the two microfarad 600 volt cap here. And these could both be classified as C1 or C3. It's a small RF bypass if necessary. Now here's the catch with this oscilloscope. If you're going to want to restore this thing and use this in you know, any particular type of service. One of the issues with this, you'll notice that when we you know, lifted the transformer off the bottom, we saw that the line cord went directly into the transformer. 
Well, these two capacitors are nowhere to be found in the chassis. So you know what that most likely means is they potted these things into the tar of that transformer. So you'd have to bake the transformer itself and then pull the transformer out with the, you know, the goopy tar coming out with it. And you'd have to find these capacitors and eliminate them at that point. Now we're going to check for this here in just a moment to see if these things are actually inside. We can do that with that capacitor checker that I just designed. We can actually see inside the transformer with that thing. So we're going to look for these things. Now, if they are inside the transformer, if the leakage is not too incredibly bad, just for this test, I'm going to leave them in there. Again, this thing is going to be repurposed down the road. And when I go about repurposing this thing and turning this thing into a different piece of test gear, which I'm going to share with you guys, I may actually depot this transformer if they are inside there. And I'll show you how to do that process. It's pretty messy process you gotta heat the you know the actual case of it up really really hot and then you know you gotta pull the insides out and it's a, it's usually a really horrible mess now the other way around that would be to just replace this transformer and that would be very easy as well the only thing that could cause an issue is this one tap here that they're using for the sweep so they're using it for this horizontal sweep here now they're just using a sine wave as a sweep. It's not a sawtooth or anything. So, you know, very crude form of sweep, but you know, this could be made with some form of a, a voltage divider across just a standard you know, secondary winding and then take that off at that point. So there is ways around this. This would be a very you know, easy transformer to, to basically find something like a, another old capacitor tester would have something like this in it. Or, you know, if you found a, uh, say a vacuum tube voltmeter, you might be able to put a voltage doubler on the secondary. There's just so many ways around this. So if you're ever stuck for a transformer in an older piece of gear like this, there are a lot of ways around that. And I'm going to cover that here in some future episodes. You know, I'll find some old radios or maybe some old scopes or some old test gear with, you know, bad transformers. And I'll show you how to basically take, you know, a generic style transformer and make it work with what you need. So there are a few rules that you need to follow. Of course, you know, the current consumption and, you know, you need to get the voltage up where it is. But all in all, it's, you know, it's not that big of a deal. So I may do that if these capacitors are hiding in here. We'll look for that in just a moment and see if we can find these things hiding in that transformer tar. If they did, that was a real stupid move on Nationals' part. Anyways, that's, you know, this kind of stuff should not be hiding inside of transformers and things like that. So hopefully they didn't do that. So as you can see, we just have a bunch of variable resistors here that set the brightness and the focus. It's, you know, very, very straightforward. This here is going to set the length of the line for the horizontal deflection if you have this on the internal sweep. So basically you're gonna be able to narrow up that line or make the, you know, the line a little bit larger. So again, horizontal and vertical, right? So you can see the drive again goes directly into this vertical plate. And then of course we're gonna be using this tap here for the sweep to give a sweep and that sweep is going to obviously be a very low frequency right because this is you know running at 60 hertz this transformer here so we're dealing with some uh, you know pretty low frequencies to uh you know to drive the sweep in this thing and of course it's not a sawtooth it's a sine wave so we're going to get a nice circular looking kind of pattern on there we're going to get a rotation kind of view when we look at some signals and that's that's the uh the advantage or disadvantage in some cases of using an actual uh, sine wave for a sweep instead of a sawtooth. When you have a sawtooth, you have, you know, a, a nice clean sweep across the screen and then it zips back to this side again. And then it's a nice clean sweep. Whereas when you're dealing with a sine wave, you know, you're going to get that kind of a circular pattern. We'll take a look at that here in a moment. And, uh, you know, when we fire this thing up after we look at these capacitors here. So hopefully these things aren't too incredibly leaky. If one of these things was shorted directly to the chassis, I would need to open this thing back up and replace this transformer before we even try this. Very, very basic. You can see that this has its own separate heater winding for this because you can see that the actual CRT ties the filament directly to the cathode here and the cathode runs up onto this voltage divider stack here. So there's going to be a fair amount of negative voltage on this. And for that reason, they need to have the filaments isolated. So it has its own winding. You'll see that the high voltage itself is attached directly to the filament winding for the 6X5 because, as you can see, this is hooked up 
as a, you know a negative rectifier so it can be hooked up because the cathode and the filaments will just tie together and the plate will be you know where the negative voltage is present here so this is the filter cap and we just get nice clean dc at that point and that's pretty much it you know we have a switch over here and a line cord very very basic little oscilloscope a really nice foundation or a start to you know build a neat little project with and this is going to turn into a very neat piece of test gear which you will see in the very near future so let's take a look and see if those uh, capacitors are hiding in this transformer well let's see if we can find any hiding capacitors inside that transformer so i'm going to use the leakage tester to do that so basically what we want to do is we want to see if there's any capacitor from either side of the line cord to the chassis of this scope. And if there is, of course, that's going to present some form of leakage to the chassis. And that makes this thing a shock hazard. So if they are in there, either the transformer is going to have to be changed or it's going to have to be depotted. So if we look on the schematic here again, we can see right here we have two capacitors and it says here small rf bypass if necessary so there may only be one or there could be two of these things hiding inside there at this point we don't know right so what we want to do is we want to test from either side of the line cord if we turn the switch on it doesn't matter because you know it'll just go through the winding and we'll see the capacitor on the other side we just want to test from the chassis to either side of the line cord with the switch on and that should tell us if there's anything hiding inside there if there is anything hiding inside here, I want to make sure that the leakage current is low enough so that I could safely put this onto my isolation transformer and we can at least see if there's a trace and verify if the little CRT in this thing is good and all that kind of stuff. And again, down the road when I repurpose this, we'll address that problem then if there is anything in there. So what I'm going to do is take the positive lead of the tester and attach it to the chassis. Now this little ground lug at the bottom here is attached directly to the chassis. So I'll click the positive lead onto that and I'll put the sense lead onto one of the pins on the line cord. The switch is on on the front of the scope here. So I'll just plug this onto here. Now this is in the mica and ceramic and paper position. So this is going to very easily detect a paper capacitor if it's hiding in there. So click it on to discharge here. And the moment of truth, what do you think? Let's find out. Oh, that's not good. Look at this. So that's pretty ugly. So what I'm going to do is click this down to the electrolytic position and if there you know is excessive leakage if there's above five microamps or so of leakage this is going to stay pinned if this goes down to green it's below five microamps so basically if i put this onto my isolation transformer you know current limited supply it should power up so let's try it out electrolytic so yeah it's below five microamps of leakage i'll click it back up there again and as you can see it immediately goes to the top so yeah chances are there's paper capacitors hiding inside that transformer and yes they're not just leaky they're ugly leaky so this is telling me that if i want to use this thing it, it, you know the way it is right now as a piece of test gear i would have to depot that transformer to make it safe so that's where the the balance point comes in if i had another transformer that would fit in here and pretty much have the same voltages chances are i would just replace this with some form of an open frame transformer either that if i you know didn't have anything kicking about yes i would probably have to repurpose the old toaster oven and heat this thing up really hot and pull the insides out and find those hiding capacitors so if you're restoring one of these national oscilloscopes and you don't find those capacitors they are most likely inside that transformer hiding where they should never have been put i don't know what national was thinking when they potted those things inside the transformer that was a very very stupid thing to do so there we have it so let's hook this thing up to the isolation transformer and see if we can get a trace on the screen of this scope. Let's see if the little scope comes to life. So from following the wires inside the scope here, and of course looking at the schematic, this appears to be the intensity control, or they say brilliancy control. This here looks to be the focus. This here would be the, you know, the horizontal width, really, is what this would be. 
and so basically horizontal gain so sweep width and this would be internal sweep and this would be external sweep so making a dot here so we would want to have this here I'll set everything at 12 o'clock except the brilliancy control because we want maximum brightness so if there's going to be anything if the CRT is weak or something like that that'll allow us to find a dot or a line on the screen at this point so hopefully we're going to have a line if everything is the way it should be we should get something on the scope so I'm going to turn on my isolation transformer and variac supply right now so here we go there's no indicator lights or anything on this thing so just have to wait a few moments and see if we can see anything on the screen so if the CRT even has a little bit of life left in it you know this is pretty much at its maximum right now just almost at the stop let's put it that way so we'll just wait a few moments and see if we can see anything here you know if you wait a minute or two or maybe even three minutes oh, it looks like I can see something already if you wait a few moments and you know say three or four minutes and you don't see anything at that time I would suggest you know moving the controls around and see if you can get anything on the screen looks like there is a very faint trace on there so this would be the focus Let's see if we can focus this up look at that the little one inch CRT lives looks like there's a little bit of burn in there it lives Let's see if we can move this around a little bit right about there is its brightest point perfect so this should go to a dot if that, that is the sweep there it is the dot right in the center so it's using the internal sine wave as a sweep so it's come to life just that quick so now I want to feed it a signal and see if we can make some interesting patterns on this screen so you know what I'll do that ICO generator the ICO 377 that I just did has quite a bit of drive so I'll go get the ICO signal generator and we'll use that to drive this thing up I have the ICO model 377 outputs attached to the vertical inputs of the scope here so let's see if we can get anything to display on the screen so I'll turn on the ICO and let it warm up for a moment there's vacuum tubes in this thing as well I recently did the restoration on this little signal generator It'll be a, a few videos down on my videos list you can check it out this turned out to be a very nice restoration I'm actually really impressed with this ICO it's very stable and you know it's got a nice clean sine wave again another neat piece for the old-time workbench it's slowly coming together so turn up the amplitude here and see if we can get anything oh I see movement on the screen look at that maximum amplitude from the ICO 377 gives a decent display so you can definitely tell that this thing could benefit from you know vertical amplifier stage I'll just zoom on into the scope screen there a little bit looks really nice nice clean trace on the screen there so that little one inch CRT is working very well this is a great foundation for that project everything is working very well the only thing I'd have to address are those capacitors in that transformer so that's still up in the air I may just swap the transformer out or you know, I might even depot the transformer so you can let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see me depot the transformer or do you think I should just replace the transformer with something else and just move on from there with the project so there we go it's looking really good I'll adjust the frequency on the ICO here a little bit So you can definitely tell that we have a sine wave for the sweep. So it's looking very nice. All in all, I'm very impressed with this little scope, even though I may have to depot that transformer. That is an ugly thought, honestly. But, you know, it might make for a neat video. So let me know in the comments below. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. Hope you enjoyed this episode involving this neat little measurement device from the 30s. If you did enjoy the video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos coming like this in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state equipment alike. So there'll be lots of repairs and restorations coming. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, you may want to do that right now as well.
If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way, you might want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'm also sharing a lot of my ideas and even some of my inventions up there as well. So there's circuit diagrams and printed circuit board layouts and all sorts of neat things up there. It's a great community. Everybody's really friendly. It's a great place to be. Check it out. I'll put the link just below this video in the description and I'll probably pin it at the top of the comment section as well. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.